Hello and welcome to KCOR members and guests attending today's Wednesday presentation session. Today's talk and conversation will guide our sights towards outer space, but without le leaving our earthly roots. For centuries, humans have been mesmerized, frightened, inspired, and intrigued by the universe and made endless attempts to reach out through research, calculations, and countless attributions for celestial bodies and the vast space in between. But never have we been this bold or reached as far as in the last 60 years. As a matter of fact, 12th of April um, was 60 years since Yuri Gagarin was uh, left up in um, space. And as we surge towards the moon and beyond, and our understanding became deeper, we also started to become aware of the serious signs of Earth's environmental degradation. After 60 years, we have finally achieved awareness of the effects human activity can have on Earth's environment. But we have not reached consensus on priorities or values we need to change to halt and reverse the damages done by many of our applied innovations or consumption habits. Have we learned any lessons here on Earth that we can apply on our increasing number of journeys to the outer space in order to protect the integrity of our solar system environment and beyond? And is there an urgent need to address this? To take us on this exploratory journey today from Phoenix, Arizona, is Dr. Timiebi Aganaba Genti, Assistant Professor, School for the Future of Innovation in Society, appointed at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, Arizona State University. I met Timmy eight years ago at one of the Canadian Space Symposiums where her presentation to the space buffs stood out as most informative, engaging, and energizing. Since then, Timmy has been reaching for the stars with her postdoctoral and fellowship at the Center for International Governance in Waterloo, where she focused on environmental governance. She's on the Space Generation Advisory Council supporting the UN program on space applications. She worked on studies for Canadian Space Agency. She was also teaching associate and associate chair of the Space Policy, Law and Economics Department at the International Space University in France. She was part of Nigerian Youth Service Corp at the Nigerian National Space Research and Development Agency. She has just accepted to be the chair of the African Space Foundation, I understand. Um, Timmy produced TED Talks, 12 episodes of Ladies Do Launch, uh, Launch podcasts, and launched the Space Governance Lab concept in 2020 also wrote and published several papers among many achievements. She is also the proud mother of her 18 months old beautiful daughter. Timmy, it's my special privilege to introduce you today and be the facilitator for our session. We will follow your presentation with questions that everyone can send through chat or raise their hand. Timmy, your turn to take us on this journey. Thank you so much. It is my, can you hear me? It is my pleasure and my honor to be here to have this conversation. And I just wanna say from the outset, I don't think I have any answers here. I am, I basically have questions. This, I'm workshopping an idea for a book project that I'm gonna be working on. And so I really want to raise some of these issues here today because this is such a distinguished audience 
And I've also invited a few of my space colleagues who are distinguished friends as well, so that we can all workshop this idea. So the relevant thing from my bio here, of course, is that my postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for International Governance Innovation was based on environmental governance. But my start in the environmental sphere and the connection with space was actually when I was at the Nigerian Space Agency and Legal Affairs and International Corporation. And one of the first things I had to do was figure out Nigeria's positions on space debris. And my boss was kind of like, well, why don't we look at some of the ultra hazardous activities on Earth and how relevant they would be to the discussion? Um, I recently published in the Journal of Transnational Environmental Law about the use of satellites for Earth observation for greenhouse gas emissions monitoring. So that's a little bit of my background. And, to, and later today, I'm going to be on the Space to Grow podcast by Astroscale, which is a company that you know aims to clean up space um, from the space junk. So that's a little bit about my um, background. And for some reason, my slides aren't moving. OK, so the abstract for this talk, basically, we're going to be focused on the fact that the waste problem we have today in space is space debris. But tomorrow, it will be as a result of the establishment of an in-space economy. Because the way people are dreaming about space is that we're going to become a multi-planetary species, and a lot of space activity is going to happen. And I'm really looking at if we're going to have more and more activities from a diverse range of actors, what is the role of liability for environmental damage caused by space activities? But I also know that there's a lot of problems with that. So I want to brainstorm here today if there are other tools besides liability that can be looked at as a model for how we can preserve the space environment. So the top topic, the title of this talk is Issues in the Emerging Space 5.0 Era, Environmental Liability at the Frontier. So according to Chris Van Eege, who is here today, there are three underlying myths of space governance today, that there is no relevant history, that there are no direct victims, and no applicable law for space exploration and exploitation. The future that I was referring to in my 2019 TEDx talk called the future of the space 4.0 era has already arrived in the form of space 5.0, where these myths are being debunked. So what are the other four eras as conceptualized by the European Space Agency? And as summarized by Danny Bedner, the first era of space on the outside here is space 1.0, which can be considered to be the early study of astronomy and even astrology. The next era, space 2.0, came about with spacefaring nations engaging in a space race that led to the Apollo moon landings. The third era, space 3.0, with the conception of the International Space Station, showed that we understood and valued space as the next frontier for cooperation and exploitation. Space 4.0 era, a time when space is evolving from being the preserve of the governments of a few spacefaring nations to a situation in which there is the increased number of diverse space actors around the world, including the emergence of private companies, participation with academia, industry and citizens, digitalization and global interaction. For example, in space 4.0 era, you may have heard of billionaires such as Elon Musk, Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos sojourning into space, as well as the increased number of countries, particularly developing countries exploring space. These countries in 2018 spent over $70 billion in their space programs, ranging from 12 million in the Philippines to 40, million in the, 40 billion in the US. And I love this slide because you can see the relative spending between the, the different countries within each other. And even in Africa alone, there are 16 space programs with the African Union developing the Continental Wide African Space Agency in 2023. But being a space advocate in the space 4.0 era has engendered mixed feelings of excitement and worry. Is our space future going to be one marked by promise and progress or more of the same injustices we have seen in the past as scientists and innovators pay little attention to social concerns? A new breed of advocates are calling for change which marks the space 5.0 era. Now the space 5.0 era is characterized by three trends which have law, governance and ethics at the center. So resisting the structures of coloniality, a move towards operationalizing equity 
and the call for thinking about the application of principles of general areas of terrestrial law to the space domain to prevent a void in regulation. First, resisting the structures of coloniality. There are conflicting views of the freedom of outer space, the right of access to and the common benefits of space, leading to conflict and continued asymmetries in those rights. These differences can and are threatening to lead to competing practices amongst nations in space as matters of law, practice, and development. The greatest differences could lead to vastly different benefits accruing to different states and peoples, to unsustainable misuse of resources, and to geopolitical com competition and conflict. These conflicting views are due in part to the historical remnants and continuing assumptions of colonial thinking and in part are based on ambiguities of the language of the framing constitution of space, the Outer Space Treaty. The major space powers, those who have the greatest capability to access space, are those who benefited most from the last period of colonialism and the post-World War II period. Those that were most dominated in this period and left with underdeveloped economies generally have the least capability. Even without explicit colonial domination, countries with greater access sometimes use policy and legal means to restrict others' access to technology or other means that would let them benefit from space access. The language of Article I of the Outer Space Treaty, that space should be used and explored for the benefit and in the interests of all countries, is indeed ambiguous enough to give at least partial support to conflicting interpretations. These ambiguities and interpretive arguments revolve around concepts and language of freedom of access and use and common benefit by not adequately considering, amongst other things, the principles of fairness from a socio-legal perspective and the operationalization of equity. But the first issue that arises out of the freedom of outer space in a capitalistic context is the specter of unfettered use of the space environment and the tragedy of the commons. Finding practical ways to address this problem is also the first step to operationalize equity and looking at principles applicable in the terrestrial environmental law arena to fill the void. Waste is an inevitable byproduct of any activity. The waste problem we have today in space is space debris and tomorrow will be the result of the establishment of an in-space economy. Space debris is a growing problem and left unchecked has the potential to reduce the ability of humanity to use and enjoy the space environment as future visions of our utilization of the space environment propose. Coupled with proposed resource extraction projects, the space environments and activities could be disrupted through adverse changes to the space environment, which we cannot fully predict today. This anthropocentric claim does not take into consideration whether the outer space environment should be protected for its own intrinsic right in line with recent trends towards giving rights to nature. It is proposed that due to colonial history of exploitation of the space environment and the freedom of outer space, space will be valued for its utilitarian value. And so in the short term, lessons learned from existing environmental liability regimes may serve the development of evolving regimes towards ensuring the long-term sustainability of space activities through providing deterrence for damaging the outer space environment and possibly promoting the collection of a pool of funds that can be used for developing technological solutions to maximize preservation of the space environment. To that end, a doctrinal study of the liability regime covering nuclear damage caused by nuclear installation leaks and pollution from maritime transportation of oil and a focus on compensation funds created under those regimes and how they are, operate should be undertaken as well as an investigation into why no significant claim has arisen under the, the nuclear regime, despite such global nuclear disasters as Bhopal and Chernobyl. This ongoing research will also assess the ongoing recent discussion around liability for environmental harm from deep seabed mining, looking at the viability of proposing a space compensation and technology development fund as a viable solution to the global commons problem of space debris and damage um, caused by space resource extraction. A comparative assessment between these regimes and the outer space liability regime will be undertaken as to demonstrate the need to reassess the Convention on International Liability for Damage Caused by Space Objects of 1972 or the Liability Convention. It seems though that there is no available measure of what amounts to an environmental concern. This may depend on human sociological and psychological factors as well as the way the message of a movement is portrayed 
as being environmental by proponents of the view. Environmental concern research, ECR, has emerged as a field of study that considers individual and social concern for the quality of the natural environment as a necessary basis for the development of successful environmental protection. This research has produced mixed results with a variety of claims made, including the plausible claim that different types of environmental concern research from the degree to which it results from the degree to which an individual perceives an interconnection between self and nature. Whilst this claim could contribute a justification to the complaint claim of this talk, that the more hostile to human endeavor and environment is, the less deserving it is of intrinsic environmental protection, environmental concern research seems determinant on the testing mechanisms used. While this is an issue with any empirical research where subjects are assessed by questioning, the conclusion reached by Van Leer and Dunlap in 1981 seems most acceptable to me that social science research had found difficulty in establishing the personal meaning of environmental concern, that the results from different studies were largely non-comparable, and consequently that the effects of being concerned for the environment depend on subsequent pro or anti-ecological behavior were not understood. This is not to condemn the utility of such research. It is concluded that the determining factor may be to acknowledge egoistic, altruistic, and biospheric value orientations whilst creating environmental messages and for proponents to develop an understanding of the way in which the public evaluates these messages. But essentially protecting the environment includes the control, reduction and elimination of existing causes of damage to the environment, as well as encouraging the preservation and rational use of environment. What is clear is that despite the definition of the term and what it includes, it is vital that the idea of protecting the environment recognizes that earth and all systems internal to it forms part of a greater system. So Earth has a place in a system that includes outer space. And as such, the concept of the environment and its protection in this context is the protection of the totality of spheres in which mankind exists or conducts activity. In other words, despite the infinite nature of outer space, to the extent that mankind can conduct activity in its realm, it is part of mankind's overall environment and the potential hazardous effects of activities in outer space should be perceived in the light similar to those of other activities hazardous to the Earth's environment. Such a proposition must take into consideration that if a decision is made to act, then basically two alternatives exist. The complete protection of all celestial bodies in interplanetary space, which is not a realistic requirement, or the protection of selected bodies and regions, which seems to be feasible. And Article 7.3 of the Moon Agreement is of interest in this context as it foresees the possibility of zones of special protection being established on celestial bodies. But once again, it is not the recognition of an intrinsic value of ex extraterrestrial environment that drives the provision, but the preservation of scientific interests. So the first issue that arises out of the freedom of outer space is the unfettered use of the space environment and the tragedy of the commons, as I said. And finding practical ways to address this problem is also the first way to operationalize equity, looking at principles applicable in the environmental law arena to fill the void. So while there are other causes of environmental damage to the space environment, the most prominent environmental problem connected with space activities is space debris. Space debris is a general term referring to all tangible man-made materials in space other than functional space objects. The Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee concisely defines space debris as all man-made objects, including fragments and elements thereof in Earth orbit or re-entering the atmosphere that are non-functional. These definitions deal with objective functionality of man-made space objects, a quality that may be difficult to determine. While to one party an object may be seemingly non-functional, it is the state that retains jurisdiction and control of the space object that can determine functionality and may have reasons for determining that a non-functional object is not space debris. So this is why it's challenging to define what is actual space junk. An attempt has been made by the International Law Association to define space debris in a legal instrument to take into consideration criteria other than objective functionality when determining the usefulness of spacecraft as man-made objects in outer space other than active or useful satellites where no change can reasonably be expected in these conditions in the foreseeable future. 
the scale of the debris problem is still being debated and analyzed. Studies performed on the detrimental effect of space debris on space activities are well documented, and the space debris has been a matter for discussion for the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space from different perspectives. While it is recorded that the results of recent decommissioning activities show a clear increase in the implementation of these guidelines, others say that there are mixed signs about how well the guidelines are working in practice. And apparently the key reason for non-compliance is said to be cost. Despite the absence of specific reference to space debris, it is debatable whether the principles contained in the space agreements can be applied in addressing the debris problem such that it should be debated at the legal committee of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. It is stated categorically that as the term space debris does not appear in any of the space law instruments, the phenomena is not covered by space law. But writers with a less strict approach to interpretation have said that given the definition of space object in the liability convention as including component parts, space debris should be classified as a space object for treaty purposes. Somewhere mid-ground is Lefendry's assertion that the basic tenets of space law are applicable to the consequences of damage created by space debris. But if the effects of space debris could be looked at as damage, as Lefendry's suggestion implies, a reassessment of the liability convention may be in order, noting that the liability convention's initial fundamental flaw is its lack of an environmental perspective. This is particularly so with respect to the definition therein given to the term damage. An assessment of modern international environmental law sees a more holistic definition given to the term damage by, um, you know, but under the liability convention, the space liability convention, damage is given a standard physical meaning and defined as loss of life, personal injury, or other impairment of health or loss of damage to property of states or of persons. This limitation prevents any scope being given to environmental issues because it means the damage can at best be considered on the backdrop of a physical damage, meaning that the protection of that environment cannot be ensured or guaranteed. But from an environmental perspective, the damage could be the existence of space debris itself. It poses a danger to everything in its environment and left unchecked, its multiplication could potentially alter the space environment to the point where it becomes inaccessible to man or machine. The principle of intergenerational equity, a policy underlining global sustainability development treaties, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention on Climate Change, stresses the importance of maintaining the environment for future generations, a position also underlying the outer space legal regime. Though outer space is an infinite realm, some of the zones that mankind most utilize constitute limited resources. And this notion highlights the anthropocentric nature of space environmental protection. Man will only go as far as is necessary for his own benefit, such that the idea of protecting the outer space environment for its own benefits is an overly ambitious exercise contrary to notions of social justice. But Coyle and Morrow argued that despite profound societal change, only a fundamental shift in thinking, reestablishing the central importance of intrinsic value can fully articulate and justify modern approaches to regulating the environment. That said, the moral significance of intrinsic value itself must also be considered because it is the account of a moral right that determines the acceptability of a given set of legal rights. While it is proposed that only a synergistic environmental ethics that totally adopts, embraces, and balances both categories of environmentally ethical ideas is promising, it is suggested that an ecocentric perspective that would equate the other planets and planetary medium with equal status to man through an approach that classifies the entire universe or universes as an ecosystem makes little sense unless one further analyzes and breaks down the non-anthropogenic ethics into geocentric, which is earth-centered, and cosmocentric perspectives, thereby ascribing value to the cosmos as a whole and distinct from earth. A cosmocentric ethic may be characterized as one which places the universe at the center or establishes the universe as a priority in a value system and appeals to something characteristic of the universe, which might then provide a justification of value and allow for reasonably objective measurement of value. While Lupicella in his cosmocentric ethics system assigns a significant degree of intrinsic value to non-living entities, 
He admits that it would be very difficult to establish such a system by consensus. And Ralston warns against the bias, though, that only habitable places are good, as the class of habitable places is only a subset of the class of valuable places. He gives the example that even on Earth, we have learned to value landscapes and seascapes that have nothing to do with human comfort, like Antarctica, Sahara, marine depths. And just, the, just as there is appropriate behavior before Earth and places, regardless of their hospitality for human life, there is appropriate behavior beyond Earth. The precautionary approach would suggest that scientific un uncertainty or lack of knowledge as to if other users of the space environment exist should not prevent cautionary behavior aimed at safeguarding it. But I argue that the cosmocentric claims are only valid to the extent that if the case is made for intrinsic value of the cosmos, it does not automatically follow that it will have the same moral significance as other members of the moral community. And secondly, so long as specific categories of humans will be impacted differently in the process of answering the question as to how or why the cosmos should be protected, the measure of value is clearly never independent of the valuer, even if determined intrinsically. So we need to head towards a middle ground. The overarching claim, therefore, is that the most morally acceptable perspective is that while humans are at the center of all concern, they are not the only concern. And bearing this in mind, there is no need to have any other perspective in light of the subject of this talk than one of enlightened anthropocentrism. If we take that perspective that we safeguard space for its utilitarian value, there is still a free riding tragedy of the commons problem that calls for mechanisms to breed, that, to breed accountability. So my question is, is there a case for liability for deterrence and also to possibly develop a pool of compensation funds that go towards technological development. This research aims to assess the outer space liability regime in light of liability regimes for ultra hazardous activities on Earth. And this proceeds through a peeling back of layers to the liability discussion as proposed by Brunet. The first layer is the law of state responsibility and liability. The second layer is the idea that rather than hold states responsible for breaches of international law, Efforts have focused on the development of a system of liability for the harmful consequences of lawful but risk intensive activities, namely for nuclear power generation and maritime transportation of oil. These agreements brought about a shift from state liability to civil liability. And then the next layer addresses the outer space liability regime. So state responsibility and liability are well discussed concepts of international law. Responsibility in international law has been defined to mean the principle which establishes an obligation to make good any violation of international law producing injury committed by the respondent state. Liability has also been defined in similar terms as the state of being bound or obliged in law or justice to do, pay, or make good something. Works by the International Law Commission have led to the creation of a distinction between the two concepts. Accordingly, responsibility arises from unlawful acts, while liability encompasses both lawful and unlawful activities. And this distinction is evident in the creation of a separate system that considers liability for lawful acts and responsibility for unlawful acts. As a result, the legal consequences of environmental harm cover both state responsibility for violation of, of international law and liability for harm resulting from activities not prohibited by international law. Brownlee has made the argument that the normal principles of state responsibility can well sustain liability, particularly as it concerns extra hazardous operations, since either way leads to reparation and compensation. Seemingly as a result of this view, the term state responsibility and international liability are often used <coughs> interchangeably to refer to the principle that holds states accountable in interstate claims of international law. But idealistically, environmental rules should be uniform and applicable to all areas of environmental law. But treaties addressing liability for environmental damage have been developed on a sectoral basis. As a result, there is very little coordination pertaining environmental liability rules. The creation of the 1993 Convention on Civil Liability for Damage Resulting from Activities Dangerous to the Environment sought to unify the liability regimes and create a sophisticated general regime applicable to all activities dangerous to the environment. 
Though not in force, it epitomizes the shift from state liability to civil-based liability for environmental damage as strict and unliable, unlimited liability is geared solely towards the operator. The rudimentary and thus linking factor in liability regimes is that they seek to balance competing concerns. As expressed by Jutta Brunet, on the first part, the regime must promote and encourage claims for compensation of pollution damage resulting from harmful activities, while also protecting operators of beneficial activities from the deterrent effects of excessive claims. As a result, the focus in contemporary environmental liability regimes is to channel costs directly to owners or operators of high-risk undertakings, but also set limits on liability that protect the industry providing the good or service. So now I wanna talk about the liability regime for activities in outer space, looking at the similarities and points of departure. Um, is my screen still being shared? So now I'd like to discuss the liability regime for activities in outer space, looking at the similarities and points of departure from the liability regimes of maritime transportation of oil and nuclear power generation, because I think these are interesting analogies. So issues relating to the use of outer space were discussed in a political forum. That's the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Whereas the forums for negotiation for the nuclear and oil regimes were held in non-political technical arenas under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Agency and the International Maritime Organization. That distinction is evident from the focus of the outer space liability regime, which was developed with the principal notion of facilitation and promotion of peaceful exploration, rather than on how to econo economically apportion liability. The most distinguishing factor of the liability regimes for oil pollution and nuclear power, which differ fundamentally from the space liability regime, is that conventions governing the former are based on strict civil liability, whereas the Outer Space Liability Convention focuses on exclusive state liability. So under this principle, the state is liable for damage caused, whether it is governmental or a private non-governmental entity undertaking the activity. Reparation for damage to private victims can only take place if the victim convinces their government to pursue a claim on their behalf. The effect of this is that the issue of liability is determined exclusively by states, unlike with the other regimes. The private entity polluters are not liable under the liability convention for any damage that their activity causes, and individual victims have no independent redress from the liable party all private individuals, whether claimants or defendants, remain outside regime. But who exactly are the liable parties? So under the regimes for nuclear power generation and oil pollution, the operator of a nuclear installation and the ship owner are held liable for environmental damage caused by their activities. The liable party under the state convention is not the operator or the owner of the space object, but the launching state. This is the state which launches or procures the launching of a space object or a state from whose territory or facility a space object is launched. By this, more than one state can be termed the launching state. And as such, each state is jointly and severally liable. The effect of this is that the victim can pick any of the states termed launching state to make his claim against. And in turn, the state which pays compensation can claim indemnification from the other participants in the launching. But just like with the other regimes, it facilitates the claiming process for the victim. The liability of the state is absolute and fault-based determined depending on where the damage takes place. The launching state is absolutely liable for damage that occurs on the surface of the earth or to aircraft in flight. In the event of damage caused elsewhere than on the surface of the earth, liability is based on faults. There is a clear difference here from the other regimes which are consistent with respect to the basis of liability. Fault is not a criterion as liability results exclusively from the risk. Though with oil pollution liability regime, fault determines whether the owner's liability will be limited or unlimited but it does not preclude absolute liability. Absolute liability under the Space Liability Convention is for damage on the surface of the earth 
caused by a space object and a space object is defined rather ambiguously as including component parts of a space object as well as its launch vehicle and parts thereof. The addition of fault for damage caused elsewhere other than the surface of the earth is with respect to damage caused to a space object or to persons or property on board a space object. So what this means is that if we impute damage to include environmental damage, it is only damage caused by a space object on the surface of the earth that is covered and not damage that occurs in outer space or anywhere else because damage elsewhere than the surface of the earth is only applicable to a damaged space object or personal property on board and nothing else. Article four of the liability broadens convention broadens the scope of this if damage occurs to a third state in the event of damage in outer space. The two states causing the damage will be jointly liable and in such circumstances, environmental damage may be covered, but this would be dependent on the claimant state being able to show actual damage to itself specifically. The outer space regime is strictest because liability is only exonerated if the contributory is the claimant, unlike the other regimes where it may be a third party. There is no exoneration for damage that occurs on the surface of the earth, not even for the basic force majeure events such as war, hostilities, insurrection, and natural phenomenon as with other regimes. The liability of the owner operator in the oil and nuclear regime is limited to an amount according to the tonnage of the ship or to the set minimum limits as prescribed in the nuclear conventions. The cost of damage is met by the supplementation of compensation funds contributed to by the oil industry or the installation states and other contracting states to the nuclear conventions. Liability for damage in the space regime, on the other hand, is unlimited and is such that full reparation of damage is assured irrespective of its amount. From the foregoing, it seems that one of the principal reasons for limiting liability in environmental liability regimes is so that adequate insurance can be obtained and protection of the industry oh, yes. is ensured. Um, but the problem with set limits is that with even, even with additional compensation payable under external funds, full compensation for the largest accidents, particularly environmental damage, may not always be guaranteed. For example, if a ship owner is financially incapable of meeting his obligations, the fund is available to provide extra security, but the fund itself is also limited. And there are certain situations where the fund is also exonerated from liability, such as when the source of oil from a spill is unidentified. The effect of this is that the victim may in some situations not be compensated. And this cannot be the case under space liability regime, at least with respect to damage on the surface of the earth because the launching state is liable for the full extent of the damage. As such, it has been asserted that this principle of full compensation is one of the greatest merits of the liability convention. The lack of a specified minimum limit, one could say, could lead to insufficient compensation from the liable state, particularly if one bears in mind the expensive costs involved in restoration of the environment in the event of environmental damage. Deirdrix was of the opinion that the lack of state guarantee of compensation, as well as no set limitation of liability is a regretted feature of the space convention. The safeguard is in fact that compensation shall be determined in accordance with international law, the principles of justice and equity in order to restore the person to the condition which would have existed if the damage had not occurred. That would mean that the amount of compensation would have to be such that would restore the environment back to the con con um, condition it was pre-damage. So legally, a definition of damage that acknowledges the importance of maintaining the environment and holding parties liable for its adverse modification will go further in ensuring that space users are conscious of the need to keep the environment free from further debris by adhering to technical mitigation standards and practices as they are determined. It may not be timely going into discussion as to creating new conventions or amending the liability convention to consider environmental damage caused by activities in space, though it has been proposed that a principles approach, similar to that followed for the principles on the use of nuclear power sources in space, could be adopted, which could cover issues of liability and deal with major problems such as definition of terms. Whatever approach is determined, to address the issue of protection of the space environment with respect to liability for damage caused by activities in outer space, 
The system of compensation for damage could be more effective and timely if the rules reflect some of the contemporary trends in international environmental law and broad trends in the development of civil liability regimes, including strict liability of owners or operators of hazardous ventures, liability limited to a maximum amount, potentially liable parties carry insurance coverage, and establishment of compensation funds for damage in excess of the agreement's liability limit. So my last slide, these trends would seem to suggest slow but steady progress towards acceptance of environmental liability as an important international policy tool. However, according to Brunet, whether or not the environmental liability approach makes sense in the circumstances remains uncertain for a variety of reasons. Notably that the broad trends mask the vast array of unresolved issues. For instance, here are three, there is no sufficient uniformity to draw general conclusions on civil liability regimes. There's a shaky pattern of support for international liability regimes and whether liability regimes, assuming their entry into force, could actually meet the high expectations that their proponents have of them. So taking a critical approach to this work, based on international and domestic experience, is it unlikely that a liability regime will play a significant role as a tool for environmental protection in outer space? In the right circumstances, they may facilitate compensation of pollution-related damage, including restoration of cleanup costs. But Brunet says it does not follow that even the goals of loss allocation and compensation are always best served through the negotiation of a liability regime. While it not be a complete answer, it is a step in the right direction, possibly, and the defects would need to be addressed if an environmental liability regime is to be developed for outer space. But I think what I take away from this is the establishment of a compensation fund, similar to that relating to oil pollution damage, which is increasingly used as an effective mechanism to satisfy liability, is an idea that could be developed for damage caused by space activities. This fund should be contributed to by all spacefaring states based on the capacity of the state and their level of space activity, as in the nuclear liability regime. If prevention is the focus, then contribution um, contributions to the funds should be also made by all factions of the industry, particularly if one considers that the elimination of space debris calls for input from the designers, manufacturers, operators, as well as service providers. The likelihood of third parties agreeing to be made liable or to contribute to a fund may not prove popular, as was the case during the development of the nuclear industry. But as we can see from the oil pollution regime, Treating multiple parties as joint polluters, or at least having contributions coming from a greater range of sources, seems a necessary consideration to ensure that liability is distributed broadly and widely, and that the focus point, which is that damage to the environment is compensated, remains the priority. So with respect to all this, I think that maybe um, you know, some of the critiques that I've had of this is that are there more future oriented strategies that can be looked at beyond liability to preserve the space environment? So, and some of the thoughts have been also because there's no property rights in space, would developing property rights be something that would help with environmental protection? Thank you so much. Let's have a discussion. Is Gabriella still yeah, with us? Uh, thank you, Timmy. <laughs> this was um, amazing. Um, with uh, certainly pulling back the layers of uh, liabilities for human activity in space and uh, very much connected to uh, the principles and standards that we have here on Earth. Let's see. Um, what kind of discussion we can have or when we think that we have there are about 130 million pieces of uh, anthropocenic uh, space debris in space and um, and that um, there are satellite swarms constellations becoming more common like spacex's uh, starlink with yeah. hundreds of satellites so how thousands <laughs> thousands exactly so that's accelerating the increase of satellite launching in low orbit. And um, how do we, um, how, what can we do to uh, protect our space? 
So we have a few uh, comments and questions. And in and uh, going by the chat, I see Chris had um, had, had some uh, comments. Uh, David Dougherty followed by Ted, and then John Mayer. So I'm Chris, excited. I, I know Chris has, has really been thinking a lot about this. So Chris, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Is your video oh. on? Oh yeah, uh, sorry. I was just throwing in some some excerpts from the, the treaty while while you were talking. I have lots of thoughts, but I'll maybe please. I'll, we want I want to hear all your thoughts, all the thoughts. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. I can also go later if we want to. But um, yeah. I I've also been looking a little bit into this too, but not nearly to the to the sort of thought level that you have. I, I really like appreciated the way that you were sort of working this through, um, from a general environmental perspective, um, even environmental lawyers or environmentalists, I sometimes find approach this in a very uh, siloed way, which doesn't make sense given what we're talking about even. Um, I, something I've been thinking about is, is exactly what you mentioned that damage under the liability convention is so much more limited than the outer space treaty, but then the liability convention has all the mechanisms to make this work. But something I think about a, a lot is um, sort of the idea with an environmental law that due diligence and, and sort of the um, procedural standards are, are living things that change as we understand risk better. And that was something that was found, I mean, in ICJ case law in The Hague, but also in recent cases um, before the Inter-American Court. And I just, I guess something that I'm really excited about is um, how burgeoning ideas like like that changing idea of due diligence and also like environmental rights there's a question later about um, um ownership of, of space in the commons i think those are some really interesting ideas for how we perceive like not just liability but also victimhood so it's really interesting talking about victimhood because like i started this talk basically quoting you saying that one of the myths that we have in space is that there are no victims. So like, how are you thinking about, you know, the, those notions of victimhood? One from like, how do we think about it from the environmental law standard? How do we think it from the emerging and evolving uses of the space environment? And how do we think about it from, not from the perspective only of the space activities, but of the space environment of itself? Like, how have you been thinking about it from those perspectives? I mean, so I've been looking at, um, from the environmental law perspective, Juice Brene, again, uh, uh, a very uh, important voice in environmental law, writes a lot about like, if you have an obligation that's erga omnis that all states can act on, does that also just mean that it's uh, an obligation to no one? Because who is the one that can stand forward and, and kind of speak for the international community? And that's kind of still an evolving norm. The trend is good, but I'm, in environmental law, there's some work to be done, I think, in terms of what state can decide that it is the one that whose interests have been impacted. Um, it, I, there's some interesting things. I'm also interested in, in sustainability um, kind of politics in the global South. I mean, a lot of it has been um, um, indigenous and Aboriginal peoples or you know, traditionally subalternated groups anyway that are pushing the needle on these ideas. Space doesn't have that, which is why it's so important. I think that they're at the table and how we use it because the knowledge they've learned, you know, gained is super important in how we understand our relationship to the environment um, mm. in a way that we're not going to find when we get there. Like we don't have kind of um, uh, uh, someone pushing back on that in space. Yeah. And I think it will be interesting to hear from this group as well about what people's thoughts are on the rights to nature. And because there's, I mean, just in Canada, in, in Montreal, um, just recently, the river was given a legal right. So it would be interesting to hear thoughts about that, the rights of nature. Okay, so Timmy, uh, we're going next to David Dougherty. He had a question regarding the ocean, the damage to the ocean. David. Hi. So you may have at least skirted around this, if not covered it, but um, uh, Chris had circulated uh, an article from uh, the Liability Convention about damage. And as I read that, it occurred to me that it wouldn't seem that oceans would be covered, except perhaps you could argue within either the 200 mile limit or the 12 mile limit. Um, and then I started to wonder whether that is actually subject to the law of the sea, but that's in effect common. And 
given the definition that's there, it would seem to me it probably would not be covered, but maybe you could comment on whether if that were in space somewhere, let's say on another planet, whether um, whether it would be covered by the tree or not. And if not, then I think it's a major problem. Uh, we can all think back to the amazing thought processes that went into things like uh, Star Trek and people doing things like setting an atmosphere on fire. Somebody's not muted. I'm going to mute him. Okay. Yeah, so, hey, Timmy. Yeah, if I could get your comments on uh, liability with respect to commons that don't appear to have owners. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is the problem. And, and if there's no, and, and like, it comes back to that whole idea of like victimhood and things like that. Because, so in the context of the sea, you know, I looked at the oil pollution regime specifically because that was a specific damage that was, that focused on environmental damage. And it still actually applies to coastal states or to people or the exclusive economic zone, which I think goes up to 200 nautical miles of the coast. So it still doesn't cover the high seas, right? You know, so so, and I think this is why we have today's problem of plastic solutions, and we have treaties being established, like the Treaty on Biological Diversity Beyond Areas of National Jurisdiction, which is which is looking at how do we preserve biodiversity in the high seas, like in areas outside of national jurisdiction, because there's nothing that covers all those areas. And I think historically, we've always thought that these environments were so vast, right? Like it's so vast, we're never gonna completely destroy them. So it's not something we had to worry about. But I think the plastics thing is the real thing that is really put into everyone's face that like environments that you think are not, able to be damaged can still be damaged and can still affect us in the long run and as the commons is becoming more accessible say for instance with antarctica and the ice melting and you're going to have more of these ships going to antarctica and other places places that we never thought of as being able to be damaged before are going to start being damaged so but the question is you know like with this research that i'm looking at liability i mean it's it's liability like i've been critiqued is like a really old concept and and you know, does it work? Does anyone care? Does it actually hold people accountable? Well, the, the option that we have right now, which is non-binding rules for prevention, aren't really doing much. So, you know, that's why I'm proposing looking at liability regimes and seeing what is there to be learned from them, even for areas beyond national jurisdiction. So directly related to liability, I was contemplating the second question, which is this. You were mentioning liability limits, and I have some familiarity with um, at least Canada's and the United States regimes with respect to the oil pollution. And um, there are huge problems with that, especially if you set up the limit. If you can manipulate the state to set the limit really low, right? then you're going to get away with doing all kinds of damage for which you never have to pay. Yeah. And, and this is and this is the problem with so, you know, we don't escape the problem of geopolitics and the problem of, you know, power, power in space. And this is where I, you know, in the beginning, when I talked of the space 5.0 era as resisting the structures of coloniality. So some of the I, coloniality is not talking about colonialism, saying that there are practices of imperialism, but coloniality is about the structures that the way in which you go about, you know, um, the way in which you go about taking things that you think are yours or like asserting your rights, etc. And so it's usually the strong and the powerful that are able to do these kind of things. And so in this era and in this context of thinking about coloniality, we think about pushing back on those practices and, and thinking about what are the mechanisms that are actually going to restore equity and restore the environment. And, you know, space is a new opportunity. I mean, the, the BBGN treaty, the, um, the, uh, the one I just talked about, biological, I've forgotten it now, be areas beyond jurisdiction is also a new treaty coming out. But I think space is kind of the newest area where we're going to have a lot of activity coming forward that we can rethink some of these notions. But as Chris just said, the interesting thing is that a lot of this pushback has been, com been coming from the indigenous community and those perspectives, which we don't have in the space context. 
but people in this space 5.0 era, I'm putting myself there, I'm putting Chris there and other authors there are trying to highlight the importance of these views. So uh, if you don't mind, we have at least 10 people who want to ask questions or make comments. So, and we don't have a lot of time. So why don't we just proceed and maybe ask everybody to uh, just restrict uh, to one question and then we can do more discussion after the, uh, the present session. So we're going to Ted next. Okay. Uh, the term limits to growth keeps coming to mind. Uh, I'm, I'm with the Club of Rome and we never thought there were limits to the growth in the planet until we started to actually be able to measure anything. Uh, the idea of common property resources has come up frequently. Uh, and I'm wondering whether we can look to what you're doing in space to look at how space is, create, is treated as a common property resource because we've not treated the ones on this planet very well. So the question is, are there space success stories from which we can learn? Yeah, so this is the, I mean, we just had a conference, myself, Scott, and, 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 and um, Chris were there, and it was all about space as commons. And at this point, can you believe we're even debating whether space is a commons? So under the Trump administration, they basically said space is not a global commons. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not even at the, so, so that is not a very good example. Um, and you know, the issue, and a lot of people have been looking at the work of Elena Armstrong and trying to say, you know, you think of common pool resources in space and, and how do we prevent the tragedy of the commons with respect to that. But I think space is really far behind um, because even though the initial, you know, development of the regime and everything, I would say did think of space as a commons, it's subject to interpretation of the different actors and, and how they want to view space. And it's going to be, it's going to boil down to, you know, what kind of, say, licensing regimes or, or things are established to govern how different nationalities operate in space. But the way it's looking right now is looking pretty nationalistic. You can't escape politics. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we go on. The next one is John Mayer, followed by Bob Walker, Scott Cassingham, Jean, Vic, Art, Peter Bukowski, and David Fisher. So, Ted, uh, John Mayer. Okay, hi, thanks very much. Uh, very much enjoyed that. Uh, I just see so many sim similarities uh, to the, the, the tragedy of the commons, which we cannot manage uh, uh, currently. Uh, which are uh, on the earth. And uh, I, I would think that one of the first things you could look at would be standards, not just what happens when there's damage, but steps taken to avoid damage. For instance, we have uh, emissions reductions programs now. And I think that uh, that's might be the first step to, uh, to have a space board uh, which looks at uh, any particular launch. Again, you're sacrificing national uh, priorities, uh, national uh, complete independence, but uh, uh, some kind of space uh, agency which looks at a launch uh, at a project and says, yes, this has a reasonable chance of uh, succeeding uh, safely, and we know uh, and we think we can mitigate uh, what will happen if, uh, if there's a problem or in the long term when it degenerates. We, we think we can handle it. It won't end up as space junk. Uh, uh, so, so is, is there any kind of possibility or is it already in the thinking that there is some kind of control or examination review of, uh, of space launches to, uh, to keep them uh, from falling out of the sky to minimize the space jump problem? Right. So, I mean, under, so under space law, the state uh, is internationally responsible and liable for activities of its nationals. And you know how states are, they're not going to want to give up sovereignty and they're not going to want to give up control of their nationals. But many people have proposed, does there need to be an international authority? And I'm thinking, for instance, I mean, at the moment, we only have about two to three thousand operational satellites in orbit. 
But as we've heard, SpaceX have launch licenses, licenses for 40,000 satellites. And that's just SpaceX and, and, and Amazon and, and, and Facebook and all these others have licenses for thousands and thousands of satellites. So, I mean, is it, is it gonna be fair that each state just decides that it can do what it wants? Because it's in that state's interest to have many satellites because they want to claim that they're the ones. So for instance, the US has the most satellites in space. So they kind of want to be the ones who make the rules or not have rules so that they can do whatever they want because they have the greatest number in space. And of course, the way things are going with all these mega constellations is still going to be the US, you know, dominating. But the risk of in in orbit collisions and is going to increase. And is there a need for a space traffic management system? So like the rules of the road for space, and that would need to be international. Right. So that for me would call for this kind of agency that you're talking about. Yeah, I would think that would be the first step. Anyway, okay, thanks very much. That was, that was good. Thank you. Super, thank you, John uh, and, and Timmy. Next, Bob Walker, followed by Scott and Jean. Uh, hi, Tammy. Bob here. Uh, look, your great talk. It touches on actually a number of my roots back in the 90s. I managed the Department of National Defense's space R&D program and helped author the first uh, Canadian defense science, uh, defense space policy. And in the 2010s, I was president and CEO of Atomic Energy of Canada Limited as the Canadian Nuclear Liability Act was coming, was coming into effect. So I've lived some of these things you've dealt with perhaps a few decades ago or a couple uh, uh, of decades ago, I'd offer the following as an idea. And it's the reality that you really didn't mention but was inferred and that space has actually become a critical infrastructure for the globe. If you look at the space systems or satellites you talk about, what do they actually do? Uh, communications, navigation, weather forecasting, emergency management, remote sensing. Our society depends on space. And so there is, there's money being made in space, big money. And our society has become dependent on the reliability of these systems. And so uh, why not invoke systems liabilities like you have in the nuclear energy industry where the operator is, re is liable for the waste and the cost of managing that waste is built into the price of the service. And by so doing, you could take, for example, uh, space, we're looking at deploying new navigation systems in space, build into the price of that service, the cost of actually end of life of the satellite. How do you decommission it? And so you actually uh, have a structure that holds somebody liable and there's a cost mechanism for seeing that cost um, materialized in the economics of the way the system operates. That's currently not the reality, but I think it can move in that direction. And at the end of the day, society benefits. The key here is to actually recognize that space is a critical infrastructure that not only nations, but in fact, nations of nations, the globe is dependent on and find ways of making the waste problem economics as part of the equation for the way these systems are funded perhaps a suggestion. Yeah, so I would love to follow up with you, Bob, because this, this project is the beginning of a research for a book proposal. And I really want to make it practical because it's, I mean, I mean that's, that, that was the purpose of picking these liability regimes and just saying that space is going beyond just thinking about it from a state perspective because it's becoming more operational and you're bringing in all these diverse actors. So we have to think about making those people responsible for the activities that they do. And like you say, build it into their planning from the very beginning. So, you know, I would love to follow up with you and chat more about this because it seems you have direct experience in these topics. Thank you yes, so I, much. But I, I just want to pull in one other thread here. And because when you talk about nuclear energy, nuclear energy of all the energy sources in the world is the only one by law that's internalized the cost of managing the waste. And so when you have electricity coming from a nuclear power plant, Part of your bill is actually going to the disposal of that waste. If we had done that problem with fossil fuels 30 years ago, we would not have a problem with GHGs today. But that's the reality. So it's about internalizing the cost, and there are actually examples from nuclear energy of how to do this right. So I'll send you an email and we connect later. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's super.
Th thank you very much, Bob, Timmy. Next, we're going to um, uh, uh, Scott Cassingham. Scott? Are you on mute, Scott? Yes, I am on mute, not anymore. <laughs> Um, I learned a tremendous amount uh, today uh, because I'm not by any means a lawyer, space or environmental or otherwise, but I have been thinking a lot about how communities can be established on the moon or Mars uh, within the current legal treaties and regimes, if they are come to be established, um, they might come to have a stake in these environments. And so how can these future communities be included in discussions of needs for environmental protection? Can we plan ahead for that eventuality uh, for their environmental, need, environmental needs? Can establishing settlement communities even be a strategy for establishing environmental protection regimes in space? Mm -hmm. In other words, they are the stakeholders and having them there gives them a stake and a means for uh helping to protect mm -hmm. i think i think what we have learned from the sustainability movement that we've had over the last few years is that sustainability is like core to everything and must be built in from the very beginning so and and i think like like i mean you're an urban planner right so even yeah. even the development of new cities and everything like from the very beginning we're thinking about how they're going to be sustainable and so in the space context, I think our discussions around space sustainability, the problem with them is that they have been conceptualized on a framework of global security. Like security has been the driving factor for discussions about sustainability. But if we're really gonna be thinking about people and humans living, sustainability needs to be driven by ecolog ecology, like the carrying capacity of where you are. And so yeah. that shift from um, sustainability for global security to sustainability for maybe habitability or like sustaining life is going to be something that we're going to have to think about. And I think at this point, the state's not there yet because it's such a fringe topic to talk about, you know, human, you know, settlement and all that, even though we have those discussions a lot, you know, like at the UN, they're not having those discussions. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Timmy, next will be uh, Jean, then followed by Vic and Art for now. Um, thank you. That was, this is a very thought provoking presentation, Timmy, and thank you for this. I, what occurred to me was especially your comment about um, Donald Trump and the fact that he just decided that he didn't want to have anything to do with things and the ability of a state or a corporation or anybody else to just sort of change their mind about whether or not they, they, they want to be involved in some of these treaties. And it really worries me, especially with respect to it on the extreme end of things, the militarization of space. If you're looking at liability, um, who, who would be responsible because the state deliberately went out there to militarize space and it could definitely have consequences on the ground if they're take you know, I, I it just thinking on the extremes ends of some of these things can help formulate how you want to address certain things. And I was wondering if in some of your discussions, if you have actually looked at militarization of space as a potential extreme end for trying to define what you're doing and looking at it. Yeah, so you know the interesting thing is that the military is always excluded from regimes, right? <laughs> it's like it applies to everyone else but military uses. It doesn't apply in the context of war. And with space, you know, we've had this thing where the regime was established that space is for peaceful purposes, but it wasn't agreed whether peaceful purposes includes military or not. And what they ended up settling on is that peaceful means non-aggressive. So you can have military users and military uses if it's non-aggressive, but the trend that we're now moving towards, because the Trump administration, for instance, declared that space is now a war fighting domain and they established the space force. And since then, other countries have actually followed suit. The question was, was it, it was an egg or a chicken situation because they were saying that our adversaries already made space a war fighting domain so they were just responding but but of course the fact that they responded and set up the space force you know 
set this snowball in motion. And at McGill University, we're doing some studies as to what are the laws of war that are applicable in space. So the Geneva Convention and all this, like how do we bring those principles into the space context? So that for instance, like we say, there's not a void. So in what when I was conceptualizing the space 5.0 era with those three bubbles, one of them was how do we really understand the application of like laws that are governing how we behave, taking them in the space context. So I think with militarization, people don't really think about the fact that military is still the biggest user of space. So their concerns are still gonna be number one, whatever happens moving forward. And they're probably always gonna keep themselves out of the regime. But then when I think of like air, air travel, I'm like all the air treaties also say, this doesn't apply to military aircraft, you know? so. So they're just basically going to do what they want. But I think like McGill, for instance, are doing a manual that is going to talk about how the laws apply so that at least everyone knows what they're doing. Because right now, nobody knows what they're doing. It's just like they can do whatever they want because there's no framing or no guidance. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good, we're moving along we're moving, um, with interesting conversations here. Vic Buxton followed by Art. Peter, David, uh, Zach. So, uh, Vic, can you unmute yourself? Hello? Vic? Yeah. Okay. Are you okay now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate very much that uh, presentation. But I guess what three things hit me as we're going through this was the formation of the United Nations Conference on Law of the Sea, where some of the most provocative and you know, encouraging language is the concept that it's the property of all and the responsibility of none. And that seemed to characterize space right now in my mind. And the second thing is that when you were talking about liability provisions, I thought, yeah, but where is the where is the precautionary principle in all of this? We're talking about after the damage is done. We're not talking about taking adequate steps in advance. And then, yes, the liability convention speaks to the polluter pays principle, but not much more beyond that. So I was saying, thinking that, geez, there's a lot of international treaty that have already dealt with these. You know, we need a United Nations organization with responsibility for management of space, not just the liability considerations, but a UN organization that can go out and can investigate, can characterize in advance potential problems, can develop frameworks for dealing with this beyond the simple idea of your liability and compensation. And so if you look at some of these treaties, the, the, you know, the Marpole Convention dealing with the waste from ships, you look at the uh, Montreal Protocols, got uh, lots of examples because there we were polluting the stratosphere, you know, and uh, th there's lessons learned on how these treaties evolved, how they were implemented that might assist in the, you know, governance issue for space. Anyway, that's just observation. You know, I, and, and this is why, like, this is why I wanted to get some thoughts as to what else is there apart from liability. Because, like, yeah, people, have, if, if there are more, you know, future orientated or things that we can do, the reason that, I mean, I'm a lawyer, of course, so we talk about liability first because yeah. people usually, people usually come to lawyers after the fact. They don't usually want lawyers around like before <laughs> because they feel like it just stifles everything. But I think someone else already had said that like, you know, looking at standards and, 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 and all that and the things that you can do preventative. But I feel like the problem that we have in space is not a problem, but the issue is that everything is non-binding. Mm -hmm. And so when everything is non-binding, it really is based on the interest of the actor self-interest alone that pushes them to do anything and so that's why i'm like if there's a liability regime then they have to think at least well i could be on the hook if anything does happen mm -hmm. well thank you okay super moving along uh art followed by peter david and zach art you're yes um <clears throat> thank you for this um uh, my, my involvement in space of course started in 1970 and and uh, I see the laws come a long way since then and the <clears throat> um, 
The thing that uh, struck me about your your discussion, you you sort of addressed it, and I just want to state it at least in non legal terms. But when you make a, a, a treaty uh, that ultimately you can get the wordings and, and everything that people agree to, but ultimately once you have that, there is the process of who is the policeman, who is saying who is violating whatever provision, and or at least enough to, to point the finger, which then means you need some sort of court for the uh, defense and, uh, uh, you know, to step forward and say, no, um, uh, you've interpreted it wrong. And then ultimately that court has to come to some decision uh, resulting in some form of, of punishment or, or, or sanctions or, or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> I, I think about that. Then I also say, well, um, maybe it's a little bit different depending on um, uh, if you're in low or Earth orbit, you know, it's very crowded, lots going on there, particularly sun synchronous orbit. If you uh, move out to uh, geocentric, also very busy, very crowded. Uh, but you get beyond that, perhaps it's now we're getting into a totally different regime, which says perhaps it's different sets of uh, laws and liabilities. And, and of course you can take it the next step that says what happens on the moon or on Mars or, or, or asteroids or, or what have you, where, where we're going after commercial operations. And, and really you can extend it right out to the, the edge of the universe that, that says, uh, oh, how, how far does, does this law or at least these, uh, these considerations go? Um, and, and I dare say there, there's a long way to go yet. And, and I'm not saying that, that you're, you're there and you should be. Uh, I'm just recognizing the enormity of the, of the issues you're trying to address. In any event, um, it, it, could you just talk a little bit about my first part though that says- uh, Yeah, so, so this, is a, this is the big problem. I mean, Chris can speak about this at infinite, like the problem with international law is like, people don't even think it's real law because there's no international police. How do you enforce it? And it ends up being enforced by the strongest powers. People like the US will sanction you. And it's like, but who sanctions the US, right? Like no one. And so we, you know, we have this problem. So in 2008, for instance, the Chinese did a massive anti-satellite test that caused the biggest space debris incident that we have in space. And it was surprising that people hardly condemned it because anti-satellite weapons testing is kind of like nuclear power. It's like you're a big boy and so you want that capacity. So you're not gonna condemn someone who does anti-satellite testing because you want the capacity to also be able to use that technology. But clearly it felt like it was a breach of international law because it's not a peaceful use of space. It created all this um, you know, damage in the space environment but there was no actionable harm. But what ended up happening was the US immediately also blew up a satellite but in a way that wasn't harmful, they basically said that that satellite was falling down to earth. So they had to blow it up. But it's interesting, they did it right after the Chinese did it. So they were showing them we can do this too, basically. Um, but they did it in a way that didn't create space debris. So, so there are a whole variety of different method, mechanisms in which states use to show um, what, what is good and bad behavior. But at the end of the day, international law depends on the will of the state. And so, you know, the, there's, no, there's not really anything anyone can do about it. Jan, but we, would you turn that off? I'm about to have to go on live here. Or at least close the door. Zach, can you mute yourself? Okay, he did. Okay, carry on. Yeah. Sorry, Jimmy. So, you know, so, so all that we're going to be left with is basically self-interest in the fact that if collisions happen and if you know more damages happen in space then then you know it's going to be in people's self-interest to fix that um but it's still going to be dependent on power because you know whoever is the strongest at the time will just offset their responsibility however way they want to thank you right 
Okay, so um, we move along. Uh, Peter Bukowski, Peter, can you unmute yourself? I've unmuted, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, Peter Bukowski, chemist, 40 years oil and gas, so I'm part of Satan. But uh, my question relates to law and treaties. They work very well so long as people wish to adhere to them. Yes. Our history of the last century says as soon as a state decides not to adhere to them, we have uh, the, League of, the failure of the League of Nations, Italy into Ethiopia, Japan into China, uh, the various colonial powers in various things, uh, the Munich uh, Agreement. Uh, we have war, almost war shaping up right now about nations in terms of water, Egypt versus Sudan uh, and uh, the countries to its south. Uh, we have China with Vietnam and India restricting water and so on. Uh, whether there's ethical or whatever, uh, doesn't seem to matter. Uh, so how, if you put together these treaties or laws uh, for use of the moon and so on, uh, which is coming real fast with the NASA resources map of the moon, uh, how are you going to enforce uh, those laws uh, for space when a country decides not to adhere, not when there's an accidental non-adherence, but when a country decides it's not going to adhere, which is yeah. our right. I would love to bring our international law expert in here. Chris, do you have an answer to that? Oh, God, international law expert. I don't know about that. Um, yeah. It, I, I want to quote uh, a, a, a wise person, Tim Yevi, who, uh, as payback for quoting me, which is uh, international lawyers, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, uh, countries uh, uh, follow the law, hegemons interpret it. And yeah, how do we, how do we throw around a system that you know, is, is inherently power-based and, and therefore has no kind of cap to it? And how do we ensure that people comply with that? Um, I, I see you also asked a really good question about resources on the moon, and that's a great case study for that, which is like if we have a multi-centric system with a lot of different standards and regimes that no longer talk to each other, that can be great for local development um, for different regional space unions. It can also be really problematic to ensure that people are respecting the basics. Um, that's why I like due diligence as an idea, because it ropes in all of these non-binding ideas, the planetary protection norms, the um, debris norms, as kind of modern understandings of risk. The ceiling raises as we kind of get taller, so to speak. Um, and so we can use that maybe as a way of, of an, uh, encouraging that. Also, environmental impact assessment. A lot of domestic systems automatically preclude space, like the assessment ends at the atmosphere because we don't consider it the environment, but there's not really a good reason for that beyond our failure to look up. So, and that would involve hopefully public participation, peer review, some kind of consultation, which public shame is an important part of international law, um, I guess. Thank you. All right, it seems like we're having a, a, a a very good uh, panel discussion here and, and among <laughs> Chris being a good, uh, 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 a good partner here for us. Okay, so David Fisher. David? Yeah. There. Can we can't me? hear you clearly. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, yeah, I, well, I put it in the chat. Yeah, uh, just mentioning, like, if, uh, there already exist planetary protection protocols for most major spacefaring nations. Like, well, the, the United States, well, Canada, the European Union, um, Japan. If they want to put a lander on a, on a planet like Mars or, or Enceladus or Europa, they try, they have to keep to these planetary protection protocols. And it's not a it's not a trivial thing. It costs them a ton of money to do it because the idea is you don't contaminate the thing you're landing on with any biota from Earth or contamination from Earth. So uh, in that this is already in, in force, as it were, and works, uh, could this be taken as a starting point for interplanetary law giving? Yes. 
So of course, cost, so COSPA, the Committee on Space Research, are the ones that develop the planetary protection guidelines, and then each one of the different countries develop their own kind of uh, guidelines based on those COSPA guidelines. That's not legally binding. It's um, it's optional um, and depends on you know, how the different actors say what the different requirements are. So for instance, I consulted for Canada when they were collaborating with NASA before the Canada had a planetary protection policy. And one of, to be able to work with NASA, they needed a planetary protection policy. So that's where it becomes binding in that it's not a legal requirement, but like it might be a requirement from your collaboration collaborators. And so this is where, for instance, like the Artemis Accords, which is the, the executive agreements that NASA is working with people who want to go to the moon is also showing us how groupings of actors can make rules that are not legally binding internationally but are binding among participants of a particular project the question then becomes what happens when you have different groupings of actors and they have their own kind of rules and everything because nobody wants a binding system for everyone they want principles like everyone is taking a principled approach and then they themselves will determine you know binding things the other thing with cospa of course is that the 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 philosophy behind minimizing contamination is to protect science it's not to protect the environment so i would just say that if we are going to have some you know some some things based on that science is not the only actor that we need to protect here um, there are other uses. Maybe we need to think about space for its own use. Maybe we need to think about, you know, the 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 settlements and the people that we're going to have, not just protection based on science. Agreed, but it's a start. It's, it's but it's a start. Now. It's a start. Yeah. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll move on to Zach Jacobson and maybe one short comment. I think John Legg had something if he wanted to. If not, we will stop after that. So, Zach. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I apologize, Gabriella, for speaking on, a, on an open mic a few minutes ago. It was a mistake. Uh, Problem. My, my question was... was uh, Partly answered by uh, by um, uh, Bob's excellent talk uh, not too long ago uh, um, about um, or excellent comment not too long ago about uh, uh, nuclear um, bills, including the costs of cleaning up. But mm. my question is: all of the examples here have that have been mentioned have had essentially a finite um a finite um uh domain to deal with what what they haven't gotten is when there's an infinite domain can you have a commons where there's an infinite domain space itself is infinite um mm. i can think of other infinite domains uh, uh for example um some communications uh satellites have come up in in myriads and that have has affected astronomical observations so uh, it's not it's not entirely a, um, um, a, a small thought so does does the metaphor of the commons actually fall apart at some point wow that's a deep question I don't even have an answer to that what do you think does, what can you answer your own question I'm afraid not. I wouldn't have asked it if I thought I had an answer. <laughs> I, I wasn't. I wasn't putting it in as a challenge. I, I think um, it's it's uh, possible that um, when a uh, excuse me, never mind. Somebody's at the door. They, I hope they. I hope they answer it. Uh, the, uh, the 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 question is um, when do you recognize that you are in an infinite domain, and then let's see what do we do about it. And we've, we've already seen that happen at least once that I can think of. Mm. Um, no, I don't have an answer. Yeah, it's kind of like what Art said, that there are like regions, right? So maybe we can't think of space like as one monolithic, but we think of low Earth orbit, we think of geo, the geosynchronous orbit, and then we think of deep space. But as more and more, as so, all this activity that we're talking about going to the moon in the next few years that all these countries want to do, they want to go to the moon to explore it as a launch pad for deep space. So, so 
if the development of the moon and all the infrastructure and all that is because it's going to be a launch pad, then eventually we're going to have to start thinking about that deep space and, and it being a realm of human activity. So for now, maybe, maybe that's like 20, 30, 40 years away. But I think starting to split the space environment into zones and thinking about, you know, what do we do in each one of those zones is something that we need to start thinking about. So not thinking of space as infinite, but thinking of it as we can go as far as where human capacity can go. Just let me add a comment to, to make sure that uh, we understand that um, <clears throat> this infinite space is growing. Uh, if you can have a growing infinite infinity. Uh, and, and we've also got galaxies which are still forming. And can we, as it were, include those galaxies and all the, uh, all the <laughs> heavenly bodies that are included in there? Anyway, the, you can get philosophical in a hurry. And I, I, and I really don't think that we should try and go there. I, th I believe that Chris raised his hand. He, 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 he has a comment. Chris? No, I was just clapping, actually. I was just agreeing. Um, oh, you were clapping. OK. <laughs> All right. OK. Um, John Leg, uh, did you have a comment or? Um... Uh, yes, I did. Uh, can you hear me all right? I would, yes. I would turn my video on, but. Uh, there you are. I... Oh, all right. Good. Uh, I, one, one quick comment first, and then my question, which is also quick. The answer may not be so quick. Uh, Jean Doherty asked a question about militarization of outer space. Uh, when I was with Foreign Affairs working on arms control and disarmament, I soon learned the word, which I don't like, but which is very handy and that is the weaponization of outer space. I mean, this is one of these manufactured words, but you can see how quickly uh, the question of, let's say, navigational satellites, which some people would say, especially since uh, it wasn't uh, the GPS that started uh, their own industry, it was the ballistic missiles. Uh, and when you send a ballistic missile, you want to start it off with an exact position. And uh, so when GPS started, it was the American military who gave that technology to the GPS people, but they, if I could invent another word, they fuzzified uh, the, the technology. And right now, uh, the GPS probably still does not uh, give the accuracy that the American military has. Anyway, that's, it's just a comment. But my question has to do with uh, what are the main accidents? You actually mentioned one, uh, Dr. Aganava. The, uh, the question of what, may, what are the main accidents that have occurred in outer space or uh, coming back to Earth. I seem to remember uh, that Canada spent an awful lot of money trying to track down nuclear bits up yeah. in the Canadian Arctic. Now, there may have been other accidents, but I guess my question is, have they affected, uh, as, I, as I would hope they have, the evolution of your work on the environmental liability regime, because uh, well, anyway, you've already you've already talked about how people would prefer to go to lawyers afterwards, but the fact of the matter is, some of these accidents happened probably before an awful lot of your work, and it just seems to me that you have to take account, if you can. Of, of those accidents, those occurrences, let's say. Mm. You commented on, other than the Chinese, quote, big accident, which uh, I've, I'm quite intrigued about. And then, of course, the Americans showing off that they could, they could do it, but even better, uh, and so on. Other, other occurrences, 
Mm. So and there have been that, that's a really interesting question because the Cosmos 954 case, the one you talked about between the USSR and Canada, is the one that we all learn about because it's the only case where the liability convention was actually used, even though they did the the Russians did not, you know, basically claim it, but you know, they had a settlement, like I think they settled for three million dollars or something like that. Um, but that's the only case that the, li the Space Liability Convention has been brought up. But most of the disputes that come up in space is dealt with diplomatically. And so it's, and, and I think because it's just been easier that way and because space has been so political, it's just like been dealt with that way. But re in recent times, we've had some more incidences. I think there was recently, very recently, a Chinese object fell down in Africa um, in an African country, um, but there hasn't been that many cases. But again, like we say, even though there's been space activity for 60 years, we, it's, it's only exponentially increasing now that we've got increased access to space, right? Mm -hmm. Now that the commercial sector can, you know, now that SpaceX is here and it's really cheap to get into space and now universities and developing countries and people can launch satellites for 200,000 or $500,000 you know, it's really now that we're going to see what are the risks that that are going to materialize and, and, and thinking about how do we go beyond just diplomatic arrangements so that people actually have places that they can go to. It's really interesting in D Dubai is really leading in this. They have a project right now trying to research innovations in, in law and dispute resolution and training their judges on being able to resolve space disputes. So, you know, people are really thinking about the next phase. And this is why I, again, am calling the space 5.0 era, the ethics and the law era, because it's actually gonna take things into a more, yes, one on the sociological standpoint of like figuring out how society is affected by space activities. And then two, giving them specific mediums in which to redress for the way space affects them. Right, it seems to me that there are uh... Humor is always a bit dangerous in, uh, in diplomacy, but there must be uh, for you and Chris a great potential uh, about the Chinese belt and road and dropping something from outer space on Africa. But right. <laughs> me, that's just my sarcasm because there's not much love lost uh, with China these days. Right. <laughs> Okay, I think we're coming to the end of our session today. And um, um, we will uh, complete it now with um, uh, just information that we follow up uh, after the recording will stop with a conversation. You can stay on. But for now, Timmy, thank you very much for the most informative and intriguing presentation and discussion. And we look forward to a follow up on the success of your work. And um, please stay on. The recording now will stop. Thank you very much.